The next generation of My Hero Academia is a topic you guys know I love to talk about, and today we're taking it one step further than my previous videos. In this one, we're conceptualizing how the world of My Hero could change 30 years after Deku enrolled at UA. This includes topics such as the kids of UA students and what their quirks would be, as well as how Deku intends to find a successor and how the quirk singularity will create new groups of villains. What I'm going to do is explain the setting and then I'll explain Deku and his family before getting into the plot summary that I made up. Before we get into it though, there are two buttons you should press. The first is the sub button, as I think we can reach 150k before the end of the year. And the second is the join button. By hitting the join button, you can become a member of this channel for just $2 and get access to my private Discord server where we talk about theories and just other random stuff. Hopefully I'll see some of you there, but without further ado, let's get into the video. Back in the beginning of My Hero Academia, around 80% of the human population was born with a quirk, and in the future this percentage would have only increased, perhaps to around 95%. With more and more quirks mixing together, hybrid abilities like Todoroki's Half Hot Half Cold have become much more common, with one in every four children having this sort of power. Additionally, quirks themselves have become more powerful, with random abilities like Eri's Rewind quirk being seen more often. This would result in big changes to society, namely that the Quirk Singularity Doomsday Theory has now gained mainstream traction. For those that don't know, the Quirk Singularity Theory was first mentioned during Season 4, and it claims that powers will get stronger with each generation due to quirks mixing together, until we reach a point where the hardware of human bodies can no longer handle the software of quirks. In 30 years time, the theory will be more widely accepted due to the growing number of overpowered quirks, which of course will result in more fear mongering about the future of humanity. This fear would be exploited by new villain groups to gain members, and the villains I wanted to focus on for this video is an organization I decided to call Reset and you know that name is based on their goals. The group believes that the quirk singularity is meant to restart humanity and create a society where only powerful individuals like them should survive. To achieve this utopia even faster, they want to eradicate those with weak bloodlines which first requires the takedown of heroes so that no one can stop them. Basically, they're fascists who want to speed up natural selection by destroying those they perceive as weak, and the main thing standing in their way is the top heroes. Reset have quietly been recruiting an underground army, with new members only having the best of the best quirks. They have an intricate plan to get rid of Deku and acquire the power of one for all, and it's already working better than expected. When the day comes that they can obtain that power, then there will truly be no one who can stop them. For now though, let's move on to what's going on with Izuku Midoriya all those years after he enrolled at UA. As he promised at the beginning of the series, Deku would have fulfilled his goal by now of becoming the greatest hero, but in doing so, the secret of One For All is now public knowledge. Spoilers ahead for those of you who don't read the manga, but Midoriya would have unlocked all the quirks inside One For All, making it impossible to hide the truth about this power. It was foreshadowed this would happen back in chapter 284, as there's only so many lies that Deku can tell to cover up his multiple quirks. At one point you just have to tell the truth, because the symbol of peace, you know, to be the symbol, people have to trust you. Of course, after revealing the truth, his personal life would be changed forever and mostly in a bad way. The primary reason why One for All was a secret in the first place was because if people knew, then it puts the user and the people they care about at risk. This was proven to be correct, as villains from all over the world would attempt to kidnap Deku's relatives and friends every other week to, you know, to get him to transfer One for All to them. As a consequence, Midoriya has had to live an incredibly secretive personal life for a long time now, and uh, very few people know of his relationship to Ochako Uraraka, with the situation becoming harder to keep a secret when she gave birth to twins 15 years ago. Because Harukoshi is a massive Star Wars fan, I think it's likely that if Deku ever had kids, they would definitely be twins. In Star Wars, the chosen one, Anakin Skywalker, was a father to twins, and in the world of My Hero Academia, Deku himself was referred to as the chosen one due to him being All Might's successor. For that reason, I feel there would be a parallel, and yeah, Deku would have a boy and a girl. In order to ensure the twins' safety from, you know, all these crazy people who want to steal one for all from him, Midoriya would suggest the kids take their mother's last name to avoid any public connection to him. This would be one of many things Midoriya would do to try and give his kids a normal childhood, but ultimately he'd fail at doing this. The twins would have a relatively secluded upbringing and were homeschooled wherever possible, 
and the only interaction they got with other children was mainly just, you know, kids of Deku's close friends such as, you know, Todoroki or, uh, I wanted to say Bakugo but I doubt he would have children, he just seems like he'd be entirely focused on his hero career. Over time, this has caused Izuku to resent having one for all on some level, as he believes that he made the wrong decision in telling the truth to the public. For the 15 years since the twins were born, Midoriya has grappled back and forth with the idea of finding a successor, and on one occasion he considered passing it to Eri. However, his innate urge to save people always overruled and he never felt truly ready to give up the power, until now. Before I get into why Deku is ready to give it up, let me explain Deku's kids and what their quirks are. For those of you who haven't seen my specific video on this original character, I decided to name Deku's first child Nori Uraraka, and this was a reference to All Might, whose real name was of course Toshinori Yagi. It's pretty much inevitable that Deku would name one of his kids after his mentor, and in fact he might even go further than that and name all his kids after his mentor in some way. Who knows? Nori is the eldest child of Deku and Achako, as she was born 15 minutes before her twin brother. Her quirk is called Gravity Shift, as it allows her to pull things towards her and then when she makes contact, gravity will shift in some way. For example, she could choose to make someone float upon touching them, or she could do the opposite and turn up gravity so they slam into the ground. Currently the main drawback is that she can't make anything float if it's above 4 tons. While she respects her parents, her goal in life was never to become a hero. That being said, she still practices with her quirk in her spare time, but it's mainly so she doesn't fall behind her brother. The name of her brother is Akito Uraraka, and I consider him to be very interesting. Like many characters such as Toga for example, Akito's personality is affected by the nature of his quirk, but we'll get to that after I explain his abilities. The name of Akito's quirk is Light Ray, and it allows him to disorient enemies with viciously bright rays of light that he emits from his fingertips. As you would expect, the light rays travel from his fingertips at light speed, meaning that if he gets an accurate shot, his opponent literally has no way to avoid it. Also, if he concentrates all his fingers into a single beam, then the heat can get quite intense and may even start a fire. Light Ray is an accumulation type quirk in the same spirit as fat absorption or one for all. Basically his body stores light whenever he goes about his daily life and then when he's ready to release it, the rays can be blindingly bright. It works from long range and is a perfect support type quirk as he can confuse enemies from a safe distance while other heroes jump in to take advantage. This brings us to why I think he's quite interesting and there are a few reasons here. Number 1. Akito idolizes his father in the same way that Deku once idolized All Might. But the twist is that because he's Deku's son, he feels an intense pressure to replicate his dad's success. As the child of the number one hero, Akito feels that he'll one day need to live up to his father's reputation, especially as his sister has never cared about becoming a pro hero. In a nutshell, he wants the legacy of his favorite hero slash father to continue with him. He never considered his light ray quirk to be anything special, so he trains his body as a vessel in the hope that his father will one day acknowledge him when it's time to find a successor. Now just before we move on, remember earlier I said that Akito's personality was affected by the nature of his quirk. Whilst he's in natural light, he's a brave, friendly and optimistic person, much like his father in a way. On the flip side, if he doesn't have enough light stored inside him and if there's little sunlight outside, then it's possible his thoughts may gravitate towards a dark place. But most of the time, you know, that doesn't trickle down into his everyday actions. Okay, so with that explained, we are finally ready to talk about the plot summary, which will include more details about the villains and also the other kids of UA students. To start with, I think it's only right that a sequel series like this should begin with Deku himself, as he walks through the halls of UA as a middle-aged hero. He'd be roughly the same age as what Endeavor is in the present series, and I imagine that the current UA students would probably collapse with excitement just at the sight of him. After signing autographs and doing all that jazz, Deku would walk directly into the principal's office to have a chat. At this time, the principal would be Tenya Ida, as from day one of this series, it seemed like Tenya had his own ideas for how UA should be doing things. Under his leadership, the school would have made big changes already, with the most significant being the addition of two new hero classes. So now you have class 1A, 1B, 1C and 1D, they're all hero course students. With villain quirks becoming stronger than ever, 
Ida would probably feel the need to raise more heroes to a UA standard to help combat the evolving threat. As Deku and his friend talk, the conversation would divert to the reason Deku arranged this meeting, which is to tell the principal that he's finally looking for a long-term successor. As I explained earlier, Midoriya had been toying with this idea ever since his kids were born, but it was only after he failed to stop the death of a pro hero quite recently that he decided that more people could be saved if he passed on one for all. Upon hearing this, Tenya would immediately whip out a 50 page binder full of candidates that he considers worthy of one for all, which would both freak out and impress Deku at the same time. Midoriya would explain that while he trusts Tenya's judgement, he needs to have an open mind and make the decision based on his own instincts. Therefore, Deku's proposal is to join the UA teaching staff part time in the new school year, and basically he'll observe some of the first year students as the year progresses. Eventually he'll select a few elite candidates to take with him on a work study, and after that he'll let the kids know about his true motivation to find a successor. This process will give him a really clear idea of who is both physically and mentally capable of succeeding him and taking this quirk for the next generation. When we compare this to All Might, you know, I mean, he essentially picked a random kid he just met that day, trained him physically for 10 months, and then made him use one for all on the same day he got it without any real guidance on how to use the quirk. The results did pay off I guess, but it was a very risky strategy. By contrast, Deku is being much more careful, but still fair. Now. In the back of Midoriya's mind, he'd long suspected that Akito wanted to be the next user of One For All. He'd noticed how his son would relentlessly train his body, and his motivation to become a hero reminded Deku of a younger version of himself. Deku never wanted either of his children to have One For All, as it was something that would just continue to affect their way of life. Additionally, as All Might implied, Deku isn't the type of person who is a fan of this kind of favoritism, so you know, he wouldn't want to give it to his kids just because they're his kids, rather he'd want to give it to someone who is worthy of being the next user. This is partly why his proposal to Tenya is perfect. If Akito can pass the UA entrance exam in a few months and then prove himself worthy above all the other first years, then yes, Deku would reluctantly give the quirk to his son. On the other hand, if another student was to outperform Akito, you know, in, in terms of the criteria for getting one for all, then at least Midoriya was still fair to his son and gave him a chance. Midoriya hopes that if he was to give it to someone else, that Akito wouldn't resent him for it. Anyway, we should switch over to our two main characters, who as you've probably guessed are Akito and Nori. At the beginning of the story they'd be 14 years old, with Akito having hopes of passing the upcoming UA entrance exam. The exam usually takes place in February, so for argument's sake let's just say that the events right now are happening in November. Like we already established, there are more spaces on the hero course than ever before, and Akito believes that if he gets into UA then he's one step closer on his journey to receiving one for all. The scene could open with him intensely training in the backyard of their secluded home. This training is occurring at the same time that Deku is meeting with Tenya. So right now the only people in the world who even know Midoriya is looking for a successor is Ochako, which is his wife, Tenya, and an unknown character who we'll get to later. Whilst Akito is working hard for the UA exam, Nori has been pretty much chilling for the most part as she knows she's probably just going to go to a regular high school. For the first time in their lives, the privacy that has kind of shrouded their existence up until this point is finally going away and they are allowed, obviously, to attend these public schools where they'll be seen by a lot of people. And you know, some people may suspect that they are Deku's children, I mean, they, they do bear a resemblance to him very heavily, um, but yeah, that's just a risk they're going to take at this stage in their lives. What I imagined is that during this intense training that Ikito is doing, you know, whilst Deku's out the house, some kind of accident or incident would occur that would put Akito in serious danger. Maybe villains had finally found them and were attacking the house, or maybe Akito just got in some sort of training accident. But just know, it has to be something where Nori tries to save him with gravity shift and just can't do it. In such a life or death situation, all sorts of emotions would be racing through her mind and it would cause her to briefly tap in to an unknown power. This power would have been building inside her quietly since the day she was born, and to save her brother in this situation, she would unleash it with its full force. Imagine a long range attack like air force or air cannon, it's basically something equivalent to that which could save her brother at that moment. The idea is that Nori has a hybrid quirk like Todoroki that even she didn't know about. 
Gravity shift is one half of this hybrid, and this other unknown power is the other half. Because One For All is ingrained into Deku's DNA, a part of it was passed down to Nori. In Nori's case, she wouldn't have the One For All, but it'd be something that was derived from it and started from zero. It's been building up in power ever since she was a child, and she never knew it was there because, like I said, it started out as nothing, and so it's taken a long time to reach this level of strength. Maybe it's just the stockpile quirk, or maybe it, maybe it could be transferred as well. Let me know what you think is more realistic down below, but either way, it is not the one for all, it is just, you know, uh, something that's derived from it. The ramifications of this are huge. Midoriya wasn't there when the incident occurred, so he'd spend the next couple months trying to figure out what happened and bring this power out again. With the risk that Nori doesn't have control over this mysterious power, it's possible that she could cause an accident to occur that would endanger people. So, as responsible parents, Deku and Achako decided that she had to go to UA as well. Only with a proper quirk education can you avoid being a danger to society when you, when you don't even have control over your power. And with Midoriya now watching over the first year students anyway, he could keep a personal eye on her progress. Throughout these months when Deku was trying to bring out Nori's power, Akito would start to feel neglected, and with it still being the winter months, his darker thoughts would again start to come to the forefront. We'd see him grapple between different feelings of gratitude for his sister for saving his life, but also confusion at how exactly she saved him and what that power is. Also, the fact that she's now applying to UA, which was always, which was always his dream, is now kind of rubbing him the wrong way. At this moment, you can say his personality is beginning to shift from one that was more like Deku to, I guess, a more selfish, um, I guess, a back, almost like Bakugo in a way, in that he doesn't want, doesn't want other people to win. Over the next arc, you see the difference between these siblings' natural talent, as Nori would pass the UA entrance exam with ease, although still not able to use her one for all style power, whereas Akito would struggle under the weight of his insecurity, and he would barely pass, but uh, bearing in mind that he's been training for this for a long time, much longer than his sister, so it would just kind of, you know, serve to show you the gap of natural talent between these two. Obviously, Deku and Achako would be incredibly proud of both their kids, as this would be a big moment for the family. With Nori joining Class 1A and Akito joining Class 1D, Deku finally reveals to them that he will also be joining UA as a teacher on a part-time basis. Up till now, he hadn't actually told them, as he was waiting to see if they would get into UA, and also, if you look at most of the current UA staff, they're all active current heroes, right? And so, Deku wouldn't really need to explain himself, he wouldn't need to tell them the truth, especially as he needs to see how all the students act naturally. As the kids move into their dorms, Nori would become reacquainted with Seki Todoroki, who is the youngest of three children in the Todoroki family. Like his father, he has a hybrid quirk, and his left side is able to produce these intense white flames that can turn blue when he decides to get serious. By contrast, the right side of his body can convert the lipids in his body into literally any non-living thing. Using these abilities in tandem, Seki is the ultimate spear and shield, as he can create objects that amplify his flames, or he can just change his strategy completely. Seki has lofty ambitions and wants to travel abroad to be a hero in tons of different countries before returning to Japan in his adulthood. His older brother would also be at UA as a third year Hero Corps student, and his sister would already be a sidekick at the Shoto Hero Agency. Seki and Nori were actually childhood friends back in the day, so he already knows that Nori is the secret love child of Deku and Ochako. Meanwhile, in the dorms of Class 1D, Akito would be pretty reclusive on his first day and wouldn't really mingle too much with his new classmates. Despite achieving his goal of getting into UA, he feels that it's been overshadowed by many unexplained events over the past few months. He's very suspicious of his dad's true motives about joining UA, and the incident with his sister still plays on his mind, he's still not sure what exactly happened. The fact she scored higher than him in the entrance exam, despite him training consistently for a long time, it kind of put him in a fragile state of mind, which is potentially where the villains could take advantage of him. Now, speaking of the bad guys, uh, I should probably explain a little bit their intricate plan that I referenced earlier in the video. This plan, of course, is to acquire one for all, and in the process, weaken the symbol of peace and strengthen the villain organization. You remember how I said they've been quietly recruiting an army of powerful quirk users, and the son of Hitoshi Shinzo is at the core of this. It goes without saying that at the best hero high school, 
you're likely to find the best quirks. And for years, Reset has had an insider in Sai Yue who has been recruiting a handful of students they felt would align with their cause. Five years ago, the son of Shinzo, who I decided to call Ichiro, was the first student to be recruited by the villains due to the nature of his quirk. Ichiro's power is called Inception, and he can plant an idea in someone's head as long as they say something to him. The idea will grow naturally inside that person's mind as if they were the ones who thought of it first, which will lead to the person going down a path that they likely would not have chosen for themselves. However, the idea planted has to be somewhat realistic, otherwise it won't work. Ichiro would go on to graduate and become sort of a double agent, as he was working as a psychic for his father whilst also being given missions by Reset to recruit certain heroes. In the present day, a large but currently unknown number of heroes across Japan are converted believers of Reset's ideology and literally could go Order 66 at any moment. Despite that, the main thing stopping the villains from launching their attack is the existence of the number one hero, who just has a ridiculous level of power even for a former shonen protagonist. Over the years, many of Reset's most overpowered villains were defeated by Deku with ease, and a new strategy had to be formed. The secret leader of the villains could maybe defeat Deku, but if he was to reveal himself and then lose, everything would be over. I imagine that as a last resort, Ichiro would be tasked to try and get close to Midoriya and convince him to pass the power to someone they could manipulate. Because of the limitations of the Inception quirk, Ichiro can't make Deku give it to, to anyone. Instead, the most realistic option from an outsider perspective would be to ask Deku to give it to a younger person who is worthy of inheriting it in the same way that All Might gave it to Deku when he was about 14. If Ichiro could accomplish this, then all they would need to do is either recruit a new young person who they can, you know, put on a pedestal and make Deku believe is worthy of inheriting the power, or they could just do the same process but with someone who's already part of the organization. It was a good idea, but Ichiro getting close to the top hero proved way harder than expected, and he just couldn't get that access. Back in the day, even the top two heroes, Endeavor and All Might, went 10 years without seeing each other, so you know, you know, it's not that easy getting a meeting with the top hero. Growing frustrated, the leader of Reset would have organized an attack against the Shinzo Agency without telling Ichiro first. The aim of this plan was to draw out Deku and essentially get Deku to be in a location where Ichiro would definitely be. In addition, the villain was instructed to kill literally everyone except Ichiro, so the likelihood of Deku and, and Ichiro interacting was very high. An attack on an actual hero agency is something we've never seen before in My Hero, so I imagine it would be of a significant scale to draw out the number one hero. Of course, Deku being Deku, he would respond to something like this and he definitely would show up. And as he arrived, I imagine that when Deku gets there, he literally sees Shinzo being killed before his eyes. He quickly dealt with the villain and began to search for survivors, with Ichiro being the only one alive as planned. Naturally, the boy was filled with unimaginable anger and confusion as he was unsure whether this was a truly random villain attack or if it was a, some kind of message from the leader of Reset. As his head was scrambling, Ichiro would be approached by a sunken looking Deku who offered his condolences. The number one would express how he should have been there quicker and how he did everything in his power to stop this from happening. While Ichiro was still unsure about who was responsible for the attack, he acknowledged that in this situation with Midoriya standing in front of him, this was maybe his only chance to use Inception on the top hero. I'd imagine that at this part you'd see Ichiro looking up at Deku with his eyes wide open, followed by a flash forward. The flash forward would take us back to the principal's office and this is the moment when Deku was talking to Tenya about the reasons he needs to find a successor. The implication of doing this flash forward at this moment would be clear, but for those who don't get it, Deku just got inceptioned. The beauty of Ichiro's quirk is that if an idea is even remotely realistic for that person, it will cling on to all other relevant ideas and just become something that Deku believes he thought of himself. Ichiro planted the idea that a young and fresher hero would have saved Hitoshi's life and suggested that Midoriya choose a successor from one of the new UA students in the upcoming year. This concept would be planted in Deku's mind and would combine with his real feelings about his desire to save more people, his desire to not be unfair to Akito, and his long-standing anxiety about finding a successor to One For All. Ichiro didn't know that Deku had a son or anything like that, but he did know for a fact that in that moment, 
Deku regretted not being able to save Shinzo, and so he preyed on that insecurity instead. Because Midoriya was tricked, now any new UA recruit has a chance of inheriting one for all. And of course, Reset had months to prepare an ideal candidate who passed the UA entrance exam and is now among the first years. We already knew there was a teacher at UA working for Reset, which is why Ichiro and other students joined the organization in the first place. That teacher, whoever they may be, can manipulate situations to put their candidate in a good light and ensure that the undercover student acquires one for all. But anyway, if you've made it this far, then thank you for watching the video. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the original characters and the new quirks and the basis of this plot, which I've laid out here. Feel free to expand on any of my ideas and sub to the channel as I think we can reach 150K before the end of the year. Until the next one, peace out.